This is Night by Ellie Weasel, pages 92 through 109. The snow fell thickly. We were forbidden to sit down or even to move. The snow began to form a thick layer over our blankets. They brought us bread, the usual ration. We threw ourselves upon it. Someone had the idea of appeasing his thirst by eating the snow. Soon the others were in, 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 imitating him. As we were not allowed to bend down, everyone took out his spoon and ate the accumulated snow off his neighbor's back. A mouthful of bread and a spoonful of snow. The SS who were watching laughed at this spectacle. Hours went by, our eyes grew weary of scorching the horizon for the liberating train. It did not arrive until much later in the evening, as infinitely long train composed of cattle wagons with no roofs, the SS pushed us in, a hundred to a carriage. We were so thin. Our embarkation completed, the convoy set out. Pressed up against the others in an effort to keep out the cold, head empty and heavy at the same time, Brain, a whirlpool of decaying memories. Indifference deadened the spirit, here or elsewhere. What the difference did it make? To die today, or tomorrow, or later. The night was long and never-ending. When, alas, a gray glimmer of light appeared on the horizon, it revealed a tangle of human shapes. Heads sunk upon shoulders, crouched, piled on one on top of the other. Like a field of dust-covered tombstones in the first light of dawn, I tried to distinguish those who were still alive from those who had gone. But the different, but there was no difference. My gaze was held for a long time by one who lay with his eyes open, staring into the void. His, his livid face was covered with a layer of frost and snow. My father was huddled near me, wrapped in his blanket, his shoulders covered with snow. And was he dead, too? I called him. No answer. I would have cried out if I could have done so. He did not move. My mind invaded suddenly by this realization there was no more reason to live, no more reason to struggle. The train stopped in the middle of a deserted field. The suddenness of the halt woke some of those who were asleep. They straightened themselves up, throwing startled looks around them. Outside, the SS went by, shouting, Throw out all the dead, all corpses outside. The living rejoiced. There would be no more. There would be more room. Volunteers set to work. They felt those who were still crouching. Here's one. Take him. They undressed him, and survivors avidly sharing out his clothes. Then two grave diggers took him, one by the head, and two by the feet, and one by the feet, and threw him out of the wagon like a sack of flour. From all directions came cries. Come on, here's one, the man next to me. He doesn't move. I woke up, my apathy, just at the moment when two men came up to my father. I threw myself on top of his body. He was cold. I slapped him. I rubbed his hands, crying, Father, Father, wake up. They're trying to throw you out of the, the carriage. His body remained inert. The two grave diggers seized me by the collar. Leave him. You can perfectly see, you can perfectly well... You can see perfectly well that he's dead. No, I cried. He isn't dead. Not yet. I set to work to slap him as hard as I could. After a moment, my father's eyelids moved slightly over his glazed eyes. He was breathing weakly. You see, I cried. The two men moved away. Twenty bodies were thrown out of our wagon. Then the train resumed its journey, leaving behind a few hundred naked dead, deprived of burial in the deep snow of a field in Poland. We were given no food. We lived on snow. It took the place of bread. The days were like the nights. The nights left the dregs of their darkness in our souls. The train was traveling slowly, often stopping for several hours and then setting off again. It never ceased snowing. Although these days and nights were stayed crouching one on top of the other, never speaking a word, we were no more than frozen bodies. Our eyes closed. We waited merely for the next stop so that we could unload our dead. Ten days, ten nights of traveling. Sometimes we would pass through German townships. Fairly early in the morning, usually, the workmen were going to work. They stopped and stared after us, but otherwise showed no surprise. One day, when we had stopped, a workman took a piece of bread out of his bag and threw it on into a wagon. 
There was a stampede. Dozens of starving men fought each other to the death for a few crumbs. The German workmen took a lively interest in this spectacle. Some years later, I watched the same kind of scene at Aden. The passengers on our boat were amusing themselves by throwing coins to the natives who were diving in to get them. An attractive aristocratic peristine was deriving special pleasure from the game. I suddenly noticed that two children were engaging in a death struggle, trying to strangle each other. I turned to the lady. Please, I begged, don't throw any more money in. Why not, she said. I like to give, to, I like to give charity. In the wagon where the bread had fallen, the real battle had broken out. Men threw themselves on top of another, stamping, stamping on each other, tearing at each other, biting each other. Wild beasts of prey, with animal hatred in their eyes and extraordinary validity, had seized them, sharpening their teeth and nails. A crowd of workmen and curious spectators had collected along the train. They, were, they had probably never seen a train with such a cargo. Soon, nearly everywhere, pieces of bread were being dropped into the wagons. The audience stared at these skeletons of men, fighting one another to the death for a mouthful. A piece fell into our wagon. I decided that I would not move. Anyway, I knew that I would, not, I would never have the strength to fight with a dozen savage men. Not far away, I noticed an old man dragging himself along on all fours. He was trying to disengage himself from the struggle. He had... He held one hand to his heart. I thought at first he had received a, bl a blow to in his chest. Then I understood he had a bit of bread under his shirt. With a remarkable speed, he drew it out and put it to his lips. His eyes gleamed. A smile like a grimace lit up his dead face and was immediately extinguished. A shadow had just loomed up near him. The shadow threw itself upon him, fell to the ground, stunned with blows. The old man cried, Mare, Mare, my boy. Don't you recognize me? I'm your father. You're hurting me. You're killing your father. I've got some bread for you, too. For you, too. He collapsed. His fist was clenched, was still clenched around the small piece. He tried to carry it to, its, to his mouth, but the other one threw himself upon him and snatched it. The old man again whispered something, let out a rattle, and died amid the general indifference. His son searched him, took the bread, and began to devour it. He was not able to get very far. Two men had seen and heard hurled themselves upon him. Others joined in. When they withdrew, next to me were two corpses side by side, the father and the son. I was fifteen years old. In our wagon there was a friend of my father's called Mir Katz. He worked as a gardener at Buna and used to bring us a few green vegetables occasionally. Buna and you... Being less undernourished than the rest of us, he had stood up to imprisonment better because he was relatively more vigorous. He had been put in charge of the wagon. On the third night of our journey, I woke up suddenly and felt two hands on my throat, trying to strangle me. I had just a time to shout, Father! Nothing but this word, I felt myself suffocating, but my, but my father had woken up and seized my attacker. Too weak to overcome him, the idea of calling mere cats. Come here, come quickly, there's someone strangling my son. A few moments later I was free. I still do not know why the man wanted to strangle me. After a few days, Meerkat spoke to my father. Komno, I'm getting weak. I'm losing my strength. I can't hold on. Don't let yourself go under, my father said, trying to encourage him. You must resist. Don't lose faith in yourself. But Meerkat groaned heavily in reply. I can't go on any longer. Komlo, what can I do? I can't carry on. My father took his arm, and Meerkat's the strong man, and the most robust of all, wept. His son had been taken from him and at the time of the first selection, but it was now that he wept. It was now that he cracked up. He was finished at the end of his tether. On the last day of our journey, terrible wind arose. It snowed without ceasing. We felt that the end was near the real end. We can never hold out in this icy wind, in these gusts. Someone got up and shouted, We mustn't stay sitting down in a time like this. We shall freeze to death. Let's all get up and move a bit. We all got up, we held our damp blankets more tightly around us, and we forced ourselves to move a few steps, to turn around where we were. Suddenly a cry arose from the wagon, the cry of a wounded animal. Someone had just died. Others, feeling that they were too about to die, 
imitated his cry, and their cries seemed to come from beyond the grave. Soon everyone was crying out, wailing, groaning, cries of distress hurled into the wind and the snow. The, con the contagion spread to the other carriages. Hundreds of cries rose up simultaneously, not knowing against whom we cried, not knowing why, the death rattle of a whole convoy who felt the end upon them. We were all going to die here. All limits had been passed. No one had any strength left. And again, the night would be long. Meerkats groaned. Why don't they shoot us all right away? That same evening, we reached our destination. It was a light. It was late at night. The guards came to unload us. The, the dead were abandoned in the train. Only those who could still stand were able to get out. Meerkat stayed in the train. The last day had been the most murderous. A hundred of us had got into the wagon. A dozen of us got out. Among them, my father and I. We had arrived at Burke Buchenwald. At the gate of the camp, SS officers were waiting for us. They counted us, then we'd, we were directed to the assembly place. Orders were given us through loudspeakers. Form fives, form groups of a hundred, five paces forward. I held on to my father's hand, the old familiar fear not to lose him. Right next to us, the high chimney of the crematory oven rose up. It no longer made any impression on us. It scarcely attracted our attention. An, est an established inmate of Birkenwald told us that we should have a shower, and then we go into the blocks. The idea of having a hot bath fascinated me. My father was silent. He was breathing heavily beside me. Father, I said, only another moment more. Soon we can lie down in a bed. You can rest. He did not answer. I was so exhausted myself that his silence left me indifferent. My only wish was to take a bath as quickly as possible and lie down in a bed. But it was not easy to reach the showers. Hundreds of prisoners were crowding there. The guards were unable to keep any order. They struck out right and left with no apparent result. Others, without the strength to push or even stand up, had sat down in the snow. My father wanted to do the same. He groaned. I can't go on. This is the end. I'm going to die here. He dragged me toward a hillock of snow from which emerged human shapes and rag, ragged pieces of blanket. Leave me, he said to me. I can't go on. Have mercy on me. I'll wait here un until we can get into the baths. You can come and find me. I could have wept with rage, having lived through so much, suffered so much. Could I leave my father to die now? Now when we could have a good hot bath and lie down? Father, I screamed. Father, get up from here. Immediately, you're killing yourself. I seized him by the arm. He continued to groan. Don't shout, son. Take pity on your father. Leave me to rest here. Just for a bit. I'm so tired. At the end of my strength. He had become like a child. Weak, timid, vulnerable. Father, I said. You can't stay here. I, sh I showed him the corpses all around him. They had to, had wanted to rest here. They too had wanted to rest here. I can see them, son. I can see them all right. Let them sleep. It's so long since they closed their eyes. They are exhausted. Exhausted. His voice was tender. I yelled against the wind. They'll never wake up again. Never. Don't, un don't you understand? For a long time, this argument went on. I felt that I was not arguing with him, but with death itself. With the death that had already chosen. The sirens began to wail and alert. The lights went out throughout the camp. The guards do drove us toward the blocks. In a flash, there was no one left on the assembly place. We were only too glad not to have stayed outside longer in the icy wind. We let ourselves sink down onto the planks. The beds were several, were in several tiers. The cauldrons of soup at the entrance attracted no one to sleep. To sleep, that was all that mattered. It was daytime when I awoke, and then I remembered that, my, that I had a father. Since the alert, I had followed the crowd without troubling about him. I had known that he was at the end, on the brink of death, and yet I abandoned him. I went to look for him, but at the same moment his thought came into my mind. Don't let me find him. If I could only get rid of this dead weight, so that I could use all my strength to struggle for my own survival, and only worry about myself. Immediately, I felt ashamed of myself. Ashamed forever. I walked for hours without finding him, and I came to the block where they were giving out black coffee. 
the men were lined up, were lining up and fighting. A plaintive, beseeching voice caught me in the spine. Eliza, my son, bring me a drop of coffee. I ran to him. Father, I've been looking for you so long. Where were you? Did you sleep? How do you feel? He was burning with fever, like a wild beast. I cleared away for myself to the coffee cauldron, and I managed to carry back a, cu a cupful. I had a sip. The rest was for him. I can't forget the light of thankfulness in his eyes when he gulped it down in animal gratitude. With those few gulps of hot water, I probably brought him more satisfaction than I had done during my whole childhood. He was lying on the plank, livid, with his lips pale and dried up, shaken by tremors. I could know I could not stay by him for long. Orders had been given to clear the place for cleaning. Only the sick could stay. We stayed outside for five hours. The soup was given out. As soon as they were allowed to go back to the blocks, I ran to my father. Have you had anything to eat? No. Why not? They didn't give us anything. They said that if we were ill, we should die soon anyway, and it would be a pity to waste the food. I can't go on anymore. I gave him what was left of my soup, but it was with a heavy heart. I felt that I was giving it up to him against my own my will. No better than Rabbi Elihu's son, I had withstood the test. He grew weaker day by day. His gaze veiled us, veiled his face the color of dead leaves. On the third day of our arrival at Bokenwald, everyone had to go to the showers, even the sick who had to go through last. On the way back from the baths, we, we had to wait outside for a long time. They had not yet finished cleaning the blocks. Seeing my father in the distance, I ran to meet him. He went by me like a ghost, passed me, with, passed me without stopping. I, without looking at me, I called to him. He did not come back. I ran after him. Father, where are you running to? He looked at me for a moment, and his gaze was distant. Visionary, it was the face of someone else. A moment only, and on he ran again. Struck down with dysentery, my father lay in his bunk, five other invalids with him. I sat by his side, watching him, not daring to believe that he could escape again. Nevertheless, I, didn't, I did all I could to give him hope. Suddenly, he raised himself on his bunk and put his feverish lips to my ear. Eliza, I must tell you where to find the gold and the money I buried, in the cellar, you know. He began to talk faster and faster, as though he were afraid he would not have time to tell me. I tried to explain to him that this was not the end, that we would go back to the house together, but he would not listen to me. He could no longer listen to me. He was exhausted. A trickle of saliva mingled with blood was running from between his lips. He had closed his eyes. His breath was coming in gaps. For a ration of bread, I managed to change beds with a prisoner in my father's bunk. In the afternoon, the doctor came. I went and told him that my father was very ill. Bring him here. I explained that he could not stand up, but the doctor refused to listen to anything. Somehow, I brought my father to him. I stared at him, then questioned him in a clipped voice. What do you want? My father's ill, I, answer, I answered for him. Dysentery. Dysentery? That's not my business. I'm a surgeon. Go on. Make room for the others. Protest did no good. I can't go on, son. Take me back to my bunk. I took him back and helped him lie down. He was shivering. Try and sleep a bit, father. Try to go to sleep. Yet his breathing was labored thick. He kept his eyes shut. Yet I was convinced that he could see everything. That now he could see the truth in all things. Another doctor came to the block, but my father would not get up. He knew that it was useless. Besides, this doctor had only come to finish off the sick. I could hear him shouting at them that they were lazy and just wanted to stay in bed. I felt like leaping in his throat, strangling him, but I no longer had the courage or the strength. I was riveted to my father's deathbed. My hands hurt. I was clenching them so hard. Oh, to strangle the doctor and the others, to burn the whole world. My father's murderer, but the cry stayed in my throat. When I came back from the bread distribution, I found my father weeping like a child. Son, they keep hitting me. Who? I thought he was delirious. Him, the Frenchman. In the pole, they were hitting me. Another wound to my heart, another hate, another reason for living lost. Eliza, Eliza, tell them not to hit me. I haven't done anything. Why do they keep hitting me? I began to abuse his neighbors. They laughed at me. I promised them bread, soup. They laughed. Then they got angry. They could not stand my father any longer. They said because he was now 
unable to drag himself outside to relieve himself. On the following day, he complained that they had not they had taken his ration of bread. While you were asleep? No, I wasn't asleep. They jumped on top of me. They snatched my bread, and they hit me. Again, I can't stand anymore, son. A drop of water. I knew that he must not drink, but he pleaded with me for so long that I gave in. Water was not was the worst poison he could have. But what else could I do for him? With water, without water, it would all be over soon anyway. You, at least, have some mercy on me. Have mercy on him. I, his only son. A week went by like this. This is your father, isn't it? He's, he asked the head of the block. Yes, he's very ill. The doctor won't do anything for him. The doctor can't do anything for him now, and neither can you. He put his great hairy hand on my shoulder and, a and added, Listen to me, boy. Don't forget that you're in a concentration camp here. Every man has to fight for himself and not think of anyone else, even of his father. Here, there are no, fr no there are no fathers, no brothers, no friends. Everyone lives and dies for himself alone. I give you a sound piece of advice. Don't give your ration of bread and soup to your fa old father. There's nothing you can do for him, and you're killing yourself. Instead, you ought to be having his ration. I listened to him without interrupting. He was right. I thought in the most secret region of my heart, but I dared not admit it. It's too late to save your old father, I said to, m to myself. You ought to be having two rations of bread, two rations of soup. Only a fraction of a second, but I felt vi I, but I felt guilty. I ran to find a little soup to give my father, but he did not want it. All he wanted was water. Don't drink water. Have some soup. I'm burning. Why are you being so unkind to me, my son? Some water. I brought him some water, then I left the block for roll call, but then, but I turned around and came back again. I lay down on the top bunk, invalids were allowed to stay in the block, so I would be an invalid myself. I would not leave my father. There was silence all around now, broken only by groans in the front of the block. The SS were giving orders. An officer passed by the beds. My father begged me. My son, some water. I'm burning. My stomach. Quiet over there yelled the officer. Eliza, went on my father. Some water. The officer came up to him and shouted to him to be quiet. But my father did not hear him. He went on calling me. The officer dealt him a violent blow on the head with his, with his truncheon. I did not move. I was afraid. My body was afraid of also receiving a blow. Then my father made a rattling noise and it was my name. Eliza. I could see that he was still breathing. Spasmodically. I did not move. When I got down after roll call, I could see his lips trembling as he murmured something, bending o over him. I stayed gazing at him for over an hour, engraving into myself the picture of his blood st blood-stained face, his shattered skull. Then I had to go to bed. I climbed into my bunk above my father, who was still alive. It was January 28, 1945. I woke up on January 29 at dawn. In my father's place lay another invalid. They must have taken him away before dawn and carried him to the crematory. He may still have been breathing. There were no prayers at his grave. No candles were lit to his memory. His last word was my name, a summons to which I did not respond. I did not weep. It pained, and it pained me that I could not weep. But I had no more tears, and in the depths of my being, in the rest recessness of my weakened conscience, I could have searched it. I might perhaps have found something like free at last. I had to stay at Buckenwald until April 11th. I had nothing to say of my life during this period. It no longer mattered. After my father's death, nothing touched me anymore. I was transferred to the children's block, where there were 600 of us. The front was drawing nearer. I spent my days in a state of total idleness. I had no one but desire. I had no but one desire to eat. I no longer thought of my father or my mother. From time to time, I would dream of a drop of soup and an extra ration of soup. On April 5th, the wheel of history turned. It was late in the afternoon. We were standing in the block waiting for an SS man to come and count us. He was late in coming. Such a delay was unknown. Till then, in the history of Buckenwald, something had must have happened. Two, two hours later, the loudspeaker sent out an order from the head of the camp. All Jews must come to the assembly place. This was the end. 
Hitler was going to keep his promise. The children in our block went toward the place. There was nothing else we could do. Gustav, the head of the block, made this clear to us with his truchen. But on the way, we met some prisoners who whispered to us, Get back to your block. The Germans are going to shoot you. Go back to your block and don't move. We went back to our block. We learned on the way that the camp resistance organization had decided not to abandon the Jews and was going to prevent their, their being liquidated. And it was late, and there was great upheaval, and numberable Jews had passed themselves off as non-Jews. The head of the camp decided that a general roll call would take, would take place the following day. Everybody would have to be present. The roll call took place. The head of the camp announced that Buchenwald was to be liquidated. Ten blocks of deportees would be evacuated each day. From, the, from this moment, there would be no further distribution of bread and soup, and the evacuation began. Every day, several thousand prisoners went through the camp gate, and never came back. On April 10th, there were still about 20,000 of us in the camp, including several hundred children. They decided to evacuate us all at once, right on until the evening. Afterward, they were going to blow up the camp. So, we were massed in, a, in the huge assembly square in rows of five, waiting to see the gate open. Suddenly, the sirens began to wail. and alert, we went back to the blocks. It was too late to evacuate us that evening. The evacuation was postponed again to the following day. We were tormented with hunger. We had eaten nothing for six days, except a bit of grass or some, some, some potato feel, peelings found near the kitchen. At 10 o'clock in the morning, the SS scattered through the camp, moving the last victims toward the assembly place. Then the resistance movement decided to act. Armed men suddenly rose up everywhere, bursts of firing, grenades exploding, the children stayed flat on the ground in the block. The battle did not last long. Toward noon, everything was quiet. The SS had fled, and the resistance had taken charge of the running of the camp. About six o'clock in the evening, the first American tank stood at the gates of Buckenwald. Our first act as, a, as free men was to throw ourselves onto the provisions. We, we thought only of that. Not of revenge, not of our families. Nothing but bread. And even when we were no longer hungry, there was still no one who thought of revenge. On the following day, some of the young men went to Weimar to get some potatoes and clothes and to sleep with girls. But of revenge, not a sign. Three days after the liberation of Buchenwald, I became very ill with food poisoning. I was transferred to the hospital and spent two weeks between life and death. One day, I was able to get up. After gathering my strength, I wanted to see myself in the mirror hanging on the opposite wall. I had not seen myself since the ghetto. From the depths of the mirror, I, a corpse gazed back at me. The look in his eyes, as they stared into mine, has never left me.